Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the Ultimatum game. There are actually two different versions of the Ultimatum game, a continuous one that we'll be covering later on in this course, and a discrete one that we're taking care of today. This is something that I cover at length in Chapter 2 of the book. You can check out the video description for more information about that. All right, remembering back to last lecture, we were looking at a situation where Albert and Barbara were negotiating over Barbara's car. Barbara valued that vehicle at $4,500, whereas Albert valued it at $5,000. Maybe that's because Albert really needs a car to get to work, and Barbara doesn't actually need to own a vehicle at all. And because we're starting simple, the simplest version of bargaining is an ultimatum game, so Albert is going to make an ultimatum offer. Essentially, he's going to say, hey Barbara, here's a price for the vehicle. You can either sell me the car at that price, or we're done negotiating forever. This is ruling out any sort of renegotiation between the parties, and also Barbara's ability to say, go and look to another buyer to try to sell her vehicle to him or her. This is just a one-shot opportunity or we're done bargaining forever. And we need to make one other assumption here, which is that Albert knows Barbara's value for the vehicle. In other words, Albert knows exactly how much he needs to pay Barbara in order for Barbara to become no longer willing to keep the vehicle and prefer to take the cash. No doubt about it, this is a strong assumption. But like I said at the beginning of this course, one of the sources of bargaining power is knowledge. If you know this sort of thing, you're going to be better off than if you do not know this sort of thing. Later on, we're going to analyze a model where Albert does not know Barbara's value for the vehicle, and we'll see how Albert tackles that situation. But before we can do that, we need to actually understand what happens when Albert is in an easier situation and does have that sort of information. So again, we're starting small, we're starting simple, we're starting easy, we're going to assume that Albert knows Barbara's value for the vehicle, we're going to figure out how Albert handles this situation, and then later on in this course, when we are prepared and we have a better idea about how these bargaining situations work, we'll look at the situation where Albert no longer knows Barbara's value for the vehicle. And the way we're going to analyze these sorts of bargaining situations, as a game theorist at least, is to draw out game trees. These game trees are really useful for understanding the flow of play, the actors involved, the sort of actions they can take, and also their payoffs associated with any given action. So let's stop for a moment and actually understand what's going on in this game tree. There is a lot of stuff going on here. Well, there are two parts to this. We have Albert at the beginning and Barbara at the end. Let's look at Albert's half, the top half of the game. So at the very top, we see Albert. That indicates to us that Albert is making the first move of this game. And we see right below Albert's name an arc between $0 and $5,000. That indicates that Albert is choosing a value between $0 and $5,000, which we're going to call X. And that value is going to be the offer to Barbara. Of course, he could offer a negative value, but that's not actually going to happen because if he said, hey, Barbara, you need to pay me money in order to take your vehicle, obviously we know what's going to happen there. Barbara's going to say, heck no. And Albert is never going to offer more than $5,000 because $5,000 is how much he values the car. So that takes care of the first half. The bottom half is Barbara's move, and we see that because we have, well, Barbara's name right there. Barbara is a little bit different from Albert's choice. Instead of having that arc like Albert had, Barbara has just an accept or reject decision. So just to be really clear here, up top here, we have that arc between $0 and $5,000. And because we're looking at a discrete version of the ultimatum game, that means Albert can offer $0, $1, $2, $3, all the way up to $5,000. So this is actually summarizing a whole bunch of different possible situations that Albert could choose from. But again, Barbara's decision is much simpler. She sees an offer from Albert, so she knows what offer Albert is giving to her, and then based off of that Albert or based off of that offer that Albert makes to her, she chooses whether to accept or reject. If she accepts, we see one set of payoffs. If she rejects, we see another set of payoffs. And notice that these payoffs are color-coded. So if Barbara accepts an offer, then her payoff, and actually his payoff too, Albert's payoff, depends on that offer X. So Albert's payoff is $5,000 because he buys the vehicle, subtracted by X number of dollars because X number of dollars is how much he has to pay Barbara to buy the vehicle. Meanwhile, Barbara receives a flat X dollars because X is the amount of dollars she's taking 
from Albert when Albert sells her the car. On the other half of this, we have Barbara rejecting, and in this case, there is no sale made, which means Albert ends up with no money changing hands, so he is not buying a car and he's not giving up any money to do it, so he just gets a flat zero, and Barbara, because she continues to own the car that she values at $4,500, gets a payoff of $4,500. So now that we have understood the flow of this game and a little bit about the payoffs that the players have associated with this, we can figure out how to solve the game. Now, there are usually two different ways people go about trying to do this, one of which is much better than the other. The temptation for most people is to analyze the game from top down. And the reason that this is tempting is because, of course, that is how the game will eventually be played. Albert will begin by making an offer, and then Barbara will accept or reject that offer. However, this really is not a good way to think strategically, and to understand why, you should really look at the opposite choice. The opposite choice is to work from the bottom up. Game theorists call this process backward induction, and the reason that backward induction is really awesome is because in order for Albert to make a smart offer, he first needs to anticipate how Barbara will react to any given offer. And so again, that means that Albert really needs to know what Barbara is going to be doing at the end before he can make a decision for himself, which means we should in turn be analyzing the game from the bottom up. This should make sense if you think about this for a moment. If Albert makes an offer of $10, what's going to happen? Well, Barbara is going to reject that offer. So for Albert to actually make a sensible decision here to figure out exactly how much he needs to offer Barbara, he first needs to figure out every single possibility Barbara uh, could be looking at and every decision she'll make at any one of those possibilities, and then choose which possibility is best for him. So we start from the bottom and we work our way up. And that again is the process known as backward induction. So let's get to it. Let's look at Barbara's decision here, working from the bottom up. Well, Barbara has a whole bunch of different situations to look at. I think it's 5,001 different situations because Albert could make 5,001 different offers to Barbara here. And so Barbara's decision is actually going to depend on X. If X is greater than $4,500, then notice here at the bottom I've highlighted Barbara's payoffs and blacked out Albert's because Barbara only has to worry about her own payoffs here. She's only trying to maximize her own economic wealth, as we assumed uh, heading back from the last lecture there. Well, if we look at the payoffs, we see X is on one side, $4,500 is on the other. So if X is greater than $4,500, Barbara is going to accept that offer. Similar story if X is less than $4,500. Well, now if Barbara rejects, she keeps that vehicle worth $4,500 to herself, so that's better for her than accepting a cash amount less than $4,500. So if X is greater than $4,500, the offer exceeds the amount that Barbara values the car at, so she accepts. If X is less than $4,500, well, that's not enough. That is less than the amount that she values the vehicle at, so she rejects that offer. When X is exactly equal to $4,500, we see something interesting. Barbara is actually indifferent in that case. She gets the same amount from accepting as she does from rejecting. And again, once more, going back to the last lecture when we assumed that the players are only trying to maximize their own economic welfare, in this particular case, when X is exactly equal to $4,500, Barbara can rationally choose either one of those. She could accept or she could reject. It doesn't matter. She's receiving the same payoff. So what we're going to do is actually look at two different situations. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at what happens when Barbara rejects when she's indifferent, when she gets an offer of exactly $4,500. And in the next lecture, we'll look at what happens if she does not reject in that particular situation. Again, just to be clear here, when X is exactly equal to $4,500, she's indifferent. So she could just as easily accept as she could reject. But for now, we're starting with the case where she rejects when she's indifferent. All right, well, now that we've solved for everything that Barbara could possibly be doing in the future for any given offer from Albert, we can figure out what's best for Albert. Albert has a decision. If he makes less an offer of less than $4,500, we know what happens. We know Barbara rejects that amount, and we can now look at Albert's payoff here. We can highlight Albert's payoff and ignore Barbara's payoff. The reason we can ignore Barbara's payoff is precisely because we worked from the bottom of the game tree and we went up. We used this process of backward induction, so now we no longer even need to pay attention to Barbara's payoffs that's already been incorporated in what goes on based off of what the, we looked at in the last slide. So that means if Albert makes an offer of less than $4,500, Barbara rejects and he receives a payoff of zero. 
And again, going back now a couple of slides ago, if X is exactly equal to $4,500, we supposed in this case that Barbara would reject, in which case Albert once again receives an, uh, a payoff of $0 because nothing is exchanging hands. Finally, if X is greater than $4,500, Barbara accepts, and now Albert's payoff is $5,000 because he owns the vehicle, minus X dollars because he has to pay that amount to purchase it. Well, there are a whole bunch of different possibilities here. X could be any value greater than $4,500, and Albert gets a particular payoff for that, but it actually depends on that offer value because X is in his payoff. And once again, notice that we're ignoring Barbara's payoff, and that's fine because we've already incorporated Barbara's decision into this previously using backward induction. So let's go through a bunch of different situations. Uh, first, Albert might offer $49.99, $4,999. In that case, we know Albert will get Barbara to accept, and he will receive a payoff of $1. But notice that he could actually shrink that offer by a little bit, go down to $4,998, still have Barbara accept, and now he receives $2. So that means it's not the case that $4,999 is the best offer price for Albert. $4,998 is actually better for him. But $4,998 isn't the best one for him because $4,997 is better. In this case, Barbara will still accept and now Albert will receive $3. But we can continue this logic a whole bunch of times over until finally we get to $4,501. In this case, we still have Barbara accepting and we have Albert receiving a payoff of $499, which is much better than any offer price that was higher. But notice that if Albert now cuts that value by any more, then he will go to an offer that Barbara will reject. And in that case, Albert will receive less money than the $499 in economic benefit that he's getting here. So this is better than any other possibility for him. So actually, this is what Albert should do. Albert should offer $4,501, and Barbara should accept that, meaning Albert receives $499 in the relationship, and Barbara gets $4,501, because that's how much Albert is paying to her to buy the vehicle. And just to be really clear here, this is a discrete version of the ultimatum game, so Albert was stuck making discrete offers, some amount between zero, one, two, three, or four, all the way up to $5,000. So his, his choices were constrained between zero and $5,000, and he could not break that offer amount into anything smaller than a dollar. Later on, we're going to be looking at what happens when he could be making some sort of continuous offer in terms of cents and fractions of a cent. All right, well, what do we get out of this game? What's the welfare implication? The welfare implication paints a very clear picture. Albert is coming out as the huge victor in this negotiation scenario. Barbara only receives $1 extra from this relationship. Remember that she valued that vehicle at $4,501 or rather $4,500, and the offer that Albert makes to Barbara is $4,501. So she's only getting a single dollar extra. Meanwhile, Albert is purchasing a vehicle that he values at $5,000 for only $4,501. So he's receiving $499 of economic benefits from this relationship. Albert is coming out like a bandit here, doing very well for, for himself, and Barbara is struggling. She's only slightly better off by bargaining here than by just not bargaining at all. So the lesson that the ultimatum game teaches us is that proposal power is key. It is super important to obtaining a good outcome in bargaining relationships. Now, this gives us two things. First, it tells us why in most bargaining relationships, we don't constrain ourselves to situations where we're unwilling to make counteroffers. We'll see why counteroffers are actually very valuable in the future, but you'll notice that in just about every single bargaining situation, you never intentionally lock yourself into a situation where you're only receiving an offer from the other side. You're always making yourself capable of firing off counteroffers to the other side if you need to. And this is why you actually really want to do that, because when you're stuck in a situation where you can't, things go very poorly for you. And in the one instance where we are probably all, or at least most of us, are very familiar with an ultimatum actually occurring in the real world, we see this all the time in security deposits. When at the end of a lease, a landlord has to return a security deposit to a renter. The renters are routinely screwed out of that security deposit. Landlords are always taking extra money out of the security deposit that they're theoretically not allowed to be doing. And the reason that they get away with this is because writing that check is essentially an ultimatum 
to the renter. It says, hey, renter, here's a check. If you don't like this, tough luck. Your only alternative is to go to court. And this is a situation where proposal power is squarely in the hands of a landlord, and we see that as a result, the renters are in very bad position and do very poorly in this sort of situation. That's something I talk a lot more about in the book. And I also actually have a few applications to political systems uh, where proposal power is usually constrained in the hands of a Congress or a legislature. Now, for the future, what we're going to be seeing is that this is worse than it seems. In this situation, at least Barbara received a dollar out of the bargaining relationship. We're actually going to see that that is an artifact of the discrete nature of the offers that I built into this game. Once we switch over to a continuous version of this, then the guy who is receiving the offer is really screwed. We're going to see that more. But for now, that wraps up this lecture, and in the next lecture, we will look at the situation where Barbara does other things than reject when she is indifferent between accepting and rejecting. Again, hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Take care.